Well, it works on that TV commercial. Huh? But that dog got sleeping on the on the couch. He gets off. Yeah, life. <clears throat> we are live. Live, okay. Um, uh, calling the water uh, Marin Water meeting uh, for Tuesday, July twenty first. Uh, first on the agenda is to uh, I wanted to announce that uh, uh, we will close the meeting today at Cynthia Kohler's request in honor of uh, Huey Johnson. So. Uh, all right. Um, and I think we, we're up for the uh, adoption yeah, of the agenda, but I want to make one suggested change. Go ahead, Ben. But before we go to the agenda, I thought it'd be useful if Jeannie could share with members of the public how we're anticipating, <laughs> how, what our plan is in regards to public comments tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Gibson. We just want to take the time to remind the public that they can participate in our board meetings by submitting comments via email to boardcomment at marinwater.org or by joining the meeting online using the Zoom link or phone number provided on the agenda and on our website. Emailed comments on information and discussion items will be sent to all board members and posted on our website and the public will have additional opportunities to comment on those items at future meetings prior to board taking action. Emailed comments on approval items will be read aloud at the meeting prior to the board taking action on that item and will also be posted on the website. For those, of, for those members of the public who are joining using Zoom, you can also participate during the comment period by clicking the raise hand button on your screen or if you're calling in by pressing star nine and we'll call on you during the comment period. Due to the large number of comments for tonight's meeting and to ensure that we hear from as many participants as possible, each comment will be limited to one minute. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, before we adopt the agenda, uh, uh, obviously the, the major item that we're addressing today tonight's meeting is the e-bike discussion uh no decision will be made but it, it will be a, a hearty discussion i'm sure uh so i would propose that we get the regular uh, part of the meeting out of the way first which would entail moving item number nine future agenda items up uh up one and switch eight or nine on our agenda jack were you um thinking also about moving public expression Yes, um, let's, uh, that's a good one. Let's put uh, a public expression at the very end of the meeting. And with those two proposals, if there's agreement, I'd like to get a motion to adopt the agenda. I'd move with the amendments proposed. <clears throat> a second? I seconded. Okay, all in favor? We need a roll call. Yeah. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Kohler? Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. Um, okay, we've moved. Uh, any directors' uh, announcements? Uh, I have a quick. I have a quick um, announcement, Jack. If that's okay, just about sure. the, the point that Ben made about the adjournment. Um, we're going to be taking a moment tonight when we adjourn to honor the memory of Huey Johnson, who passed away this week at the age of 87. It is no exaggeration to say that Huey was a giant in the world of environmental protection. His resume is well known to many, especially here in Marin County where he and his family made their home. President of the Nature Conservancy, founder of the Trust for Public Land, and Natural Resource Secretary in the first Brown administration. Huey was the recipient of numerous accolades and awards for his considerable accomplishments. For the hikers among us, Huey's legacy is ever present in the gifts of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, one of the nation's great stories of how an extraordinary landscape was saved for generations to roam and enjoy by a determined, feisty, and very strategic set of, ask, of activists. But it was around water that I had the opportunity to connect with Huey. He saw clearly the challenges in the way that we capture and manage water and brought his considerable intellect and vision to bear on problems he saw as fundamental. There was no one funnier or more lacerating, lacerating 
on the subject of California's curious and often counterintuitive approach to water rights. For me, and I believe many other environmentalists that he inspired, it was a privilege and an honor to have known him and a delight to be around him. Not every great man is a wonderful person, but Huey Johnson was that and more. We are the lesser for his passing and we send our deepest sympathies to the Johnson family. He will be missed. Yeah, yeah, here, here. Uh, any other director's comments? Okay, hearing none. Uh, any general manager's announcements? I, I do have a brief uh, announcement. President Gibson, I wanted to let the board know that um, the district was notified of a grant to support our water efficiency, our water conservation program. This is part of the Bay Area Water Conservation Group that in total was awarded $4.1 million in Prop 1 grant funding and our portion is $222,000. Staff will be coming to a subsequent meeting with details on the activities and matching and timing associated with this. Um, th this is a continuation of uh, in, um, good staff work to pursue mm -hmm. these grants and uh, a fair measure of success. So I wanted to share that with the board. Yes, and congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, uh, that takes us to our consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move approval. Second. Okay, any comments? No, all, all in favor? No, we need a roll call, Jack. Oh yeah, sorry. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. President Gibson? Aye. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we are on uh, number five, water, uh, monthly water supply report. I think that's Paul. Yes, uh, good evening, um, Paul Sellier, Operations Director. If you just bear with me for a moment, I will share my screen. And can you see that okay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so this evening, we're gonna take a look at our uh, production and supply through June. Um, and then, you know, take a quick snapshot of the system as it is um, this week, actually yesterday. And then we'll take a look at our projections for storage going forward. Um, our first slide is just uh, in June, this is where we ended up with a total of 63,300 or so acre feet in the reservoirs, about 80% of total capacity and 95% of normal storage for this state. So pretty decent position there. Um, looking at our monthly water production in a tabular format, this is for the, you know, the fiscal year from July through June, the total uh, production. And you can see we're about 26,800 acre feet, which is relatively high compared to the previous years. Um, and just remember, this isn't demand, this is production. Um, uh, demand is about 10% less than this overall. Um, but nonetheless, this trend of increased water production in this case continues, and we'll see that in other slides. Our imported water, you'll note we're just over our minimum allotment of 5,300. We were, we were able to get 5,626 acre feet this year, and we're continuing with that strategy. Looking at it in a, a different format, our monthly production, um, comparing the last five years together, you'll see here in, in June, the sort of turquoise bar, again, it's repeating the pattern that we've seen all year with higher numbers for production throughout the year. Though you'll notice that June, the difference is somewhat smaller. And you know you might explain that by thinking about remembering how dry it was in February and March. And so, you know, the additional water use in those months may have skewed this increase. So as we get into July, maybe we'll get a more normalized picture of what that increase in production looks like. Um, again, another way to look at it is in this running 12 month chart. And you'll notice from about, you know, 
2002, a peak there, you've got an overall downward trend, but sort of in this local zone here at the end since 2016, we are seeing again that trend increasing in demand. And it will be interesting as we go forward to see when this peak turns. Um, and we're all of course hoping for sooner rather than later. Um, moving to our cumulative precipitation, uh, we're at about 67% of average. Um, and that of course, now that we're in the sort of dry summer period, that's really not gonna change um, as we move through, through summer and into fall. Our reservoir storage then represented in this case by this orange line uh, comparing to our average for, for, for storage, we're again about 95%. And you can see that really hasn't changed that much. And I would expect these two lines to track pretty closely as we go through the summer. Mm -hmm. um, the water that we did supply in, in June was of, of good quality, of course. Um, and one indicator of that is the number of complaints that we received for taste of, and odors of that water and we received just two in June, which is a pretty good uh, achievement. Mm -hmm. um, so that was our June. This is a look at our reservoir storage as of yesterday. Um, so into you know more than halfway through July, we've got 61,000 acre feet. We're still at about 95% of normal for the day. And our partners to the north, uh, Lake Sonoma, has 199,543 acre feet, um, about 90% or so, 91% of normal for the date. So we turn now to sort of projecting out through next April. And I'll just walk through this graph quickly. Um, the black line is our actual reservoir storage to date. And as it transitions to the brown line, this represents where we, we're gonna go in terms of storage through summer. And about, you know, toward the end of October, November, when sort of a traditional rainy period begins for us, fingers crossed, um, the graph splits out into these projections. And again, these are sort of based on rainfall projections with the orange line being normal precipitation. So this is the storage curve in the reservoirs with normal rainfall and the purple line representing 150% of normal and the turquoise blue line just 50% of normal. So in all cases at this point our projections indicate we will not hit any of our um, rationing triggers by next April where the sort of 50% rainfall pattern uh, to occur. Mm -hmm. Of course these storage curves are based on our planned purchase of water. Um, and our next slide talks a little bit about that. And as you recall, we're front loading our purchases of water from Sonoma. And um, just step back very quickly. On this chart, the gray bars represent what would sort of be a normal year for us in terms of purchases, where we would purchase 5,300 acre feet from Sonoma. What we're planning to do is sort of try to buy as much water as we can uh, through summer and into the rainy period, where in somewhere around halfway through January, we're going to actually hit our 5,300 mark. And at that point, of course, we'll be into our rainy period, hopefully, and we'll know sort of what kind of winter we're expecting. And at that point, if it continues to be dry, we can continue to purchase water at this accelerated rate. On the other hand, if it turns out that it's a nice wet winter that we're all hoping for, we can tone down these purchases to minimums through the rest of the year. Uh, so it's hopefully the best of both worlds for us that we, we will be able to, to optimize those purchases in that manner. At the last meeting, there was a request to show the effect of our water purchases on our storage curves. Right? How important are these purchases in terms of um, preserving water in our reservoirs, essentially? And again, this is the same chart that we walked through before with the, the black line representing our actual reservoir storage to date, transitioning through summer here into the beginning of the rainy period in November. And the same, you know, 150% normal 
and 50% of normal rain uh, storage curves. Is normal there uh, synonymous with the average over time? Is that what we that, mean? That's, yeah, that's correct. So normal would be our 52 inches of rain, which is our average rainfall yeah. over time. So, um, so that's what this orange line would represent. And of course, the 150% and the 50% being turquoise. Now the added lines here are gray. And if you recall, these colored lines are based on our current F FY21 front-loaded purchases of water. So they represent, if we were to continue purchasing water through January and into next June, essentially, right? Uh, and purchasing almost 10,000 acre feet of water from Sonoma. That's what these colored lines represent. Were we to back off that and just, you know, try to hit our minimum 5,300, the storage in the reservoirs would rep be represented by these gray lines. So you can see in the case of the normal rainfall, this difference as we got out to June would, rep would be about 5,300 acre feet in the storage in the reservoirs. So it is a significant um, uh, supply for us and one that we want to be in a position to take advantage of. And I think our current strategy allows us to do that. In summary, then, we're going to continue with our front-loaded purchases of water um, in case the, the winter turns out to be dry. Um, as we go through summer, we're going to continue demand management through water use efficiency initiatives. Um, and of course, we're gonna to continue to monitor demand and storage to make sure that those two factors in our projections still hold true. And our weather outlook, well, we're in our typical summer pattern, so not much in the way of change there. And that's all I have tonight for our monthly water supply report. All right, any, any questions from the board? I have a couple of comments. I have a couple of questions, uh, Jack. Sure. Um, Going back to the first slide, Paul, where you had production and imports. Yeah. Is, is the imported water included in production or is it in addition to production? It's included. It's, it's the total potable. Okay. Yeah. So then the other thing um, I wanted to bring up is a couple of the small water districts, uh, I think Inverness and maybe Bolinas are in rationing mode or soon will be, which also raises an issue about some of the agricultural uses out there in West Marin. And I'm just wondering whether any of them have contacted us for assistance or if we have any contingency plans um, to help we, them with their supply. So um, I believe North Marin Water District provides water um, to a water district out there. Um, and we have a, a, an agreement with North Marin, should they require it, we would, might be able to release a couple hundred acre feet from our reservoir to help them get through this period. But we have not yet been contacted by North Marin, though I would say we probably expect that contact sometime in August, I would say. And at that time, of course, we'll bring that to your attention. Okay. I, have a I know, comments. I think it was 2015. We, we were also supplying some trucked water for some of the uh, ranches out in West Marin. So, right. And that, that would just be on an ad, on a ad hoc basis. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, we've okay. had no, re no request for that. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Sure. I have a couple comments. Can you hear me? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, a couple things. You know, what we're looking at here is sort of like holding a large glass and saying, I have water, but there's no water in the tank. Um, if you take a look at the current drought maps, the area that we're in is in a severe drought right now. And I really, I think, you know, thank you very much, Paul, for putting the, the curves up that show the difference between us using the purchased water or not. But I do think it might, I'm gonna make a request here. If there are drought maps that are current, we should actually post that as a part of the monthly water production report. Because I think the, the customers need to understand 
the conditions that we are actually in. And as Larry Bragman pointed out, you know, Marin and, or rather Inverness and Bolinas are, they're in serious trouble. Um, I mean, they're having to ration water. And so the old, you know, and it makes me think about how do we work with customers? Um, and I'll express this frustration to all water agencies, not just us, but it, it, I find it frustrating that we talk about the water year and the coming summer as if it's predictable. It's not. And I think that we need to be thinking about water supply in multiple years, more than one year at a time. I think if this, I mean, and one way that I would look at this is if, um, what happens if we look at this and say, okay, this is gonna be our water supply for a couple of years. Um, and it's just, um, I mean, the reality of the climate change that we are experiencing is that there is no predictable near future in terms of what our, what our precipitation will be. There is no, there is, the new normal is it's totally unpredictable. And I think it would be prudent to talk to the public about that so they start, so that everybody starts to understand that there's a real shift here, even though it looks like we're fine at the moment. But as, again, as um, Director Bragman pointed out, our neighbors are experiencing the drought while we're not. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It was very good though, Paul. So it's, this isn't a criticism. It's just it's the complexity of what we're looking at, I think. So thanks. Sure. Any other uh, directors' comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, do we have any uh, public comments? So President Gibson, we do have a hand raised um, by Robert Middlestadt, and we're gonna go ahead and Bert Barsh, and we're gonna go ahead and let them speak just to make sure whether or not their public comment is related to this item. Um, Robert Middlestadt? Mine is not. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and um, take your comment for um, when it's when it's time for the item. Okay. Thank you. And um, so let's go ahead and uh, go to Bert Barsh. Uh, Mr. Barsh, is your comment related to this item? Uh, yes, I have a comment, and I also have a question. And my question just is: did I, Was there an open time? Did I, did I miss open time comments or are you going to have one? That's my question. We postpone, we put the uh, open time to the very end of the meeting. Okay, so number two is I just wanted to thank uh, Larry Bragman uh, because uh, that was exactly what I wanted to find out about. And I also uh, appreciate the comments saying that we need to have a long-term plan because weather is not something we can count on clearly. And uh, the amount of rainfall we cannot count on clearly. And uh, with Sacramento shutting down so much of its agriculture and talking about shipping food down to, uh, I mean, shipping the water to LA, I think we're clearly in trouble in terms of where we are going to be getting our food. And we're gonna need to become far more self-sufficient and if our funds continue to be cut off um, via the federal government, which is what looks like they plan on doing in so many ways, um, and with the COVID crisis and with our economy clearly tanking in almost any way that you wanna look at it, I mean, uh, we are in serious trouble. The idea of spending so any I'm, money- I'm, I'm any, so okay, sorry. To I'll just, I'll wrap up. The idea of spending money on anything right now is clearly ridiculous and we need to tighten our, our belts like we've never done before. And it's gonna take some very creative thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any other, go ahead, Therese. We have no additional public comment, but just a little reminder to the public um, that all emailed comments received on non-action items will be posted online and provided to the board. Thank you, President Gibson. All right, thank you. Uh, we're on number six here now to fill a vacancy for the uh, treatment plant uh, operator. Yes, good evening, uh, Paul Silly, Operations Director again. Um, and yes, this is a request to hire a treatment plant uh, trainee. We have a position vacancy that arose because one of our existing operators accepted a position in our engineering department. 
and of course, while we're sorry to see him leave operations, I think his experience in operating our treatment plants will serve him and us well in his new position. Um, of course, over the years, we've enjoyed quite a bit of success training our operators. Um, in fact, just about all, including our current superintendent of water treatment, has gone through our trainee program. And tonight, um, we're requesting the board authorize the general manager to recruit and hire one treatment plant trainee position in the operations division. If there are any questions about that position, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Any board questions? Just one, um, at our and I know this may have been short notice, but at our last meeting, I requested that we post the position descriptions with the announcements. Is this one where that would be appropriate? Um, I, I did talk this over, uh, and, and we thought that this was a such a fairly routine position. Of course, treatment plant operators operate our treatment plants. Um, that we can certainly provide you the job description, but, but this is a very routine and sort of traditional position. So the answer is no, I'm not on this one. <laughs> not, on, not on this one, <laughs> right. Okay. And the other board have, questions, comments? No, I actually think from a recruitment standpoint, it may be a good idea to do that in the future, no matter how um, routine the position may be. Um, and just give a little bit more notice to the public that there may be an opportunity in the district. Mm -hmm. I, could I just chime in and yeah. I, I agree with you, Armando. It's 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 going to give us a little wider circulation, yeah. which may be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, we, we we will do that in the future. This was uh, my oversight. I no, I'm not complaining. I was. It, it, well, I, I, I just want to reflect that we did hear this request last time and uh, we'll be doing this in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, with that, I think we're on uh, item. Oh, any public uh, comment on this? There was no public comment received. Okay, thank you. Uh, we need a, uh, a roll call vote. Well, I guess we need a motion to approve it. I'll make the motion. All right. Second. Second. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I guess we're ready for a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Director Quintero. Aye. Director Russell. Aye. President Gibson. Aye. We, we, we need to do nine, Jack. Uh, no, we're on seven, actually. When, when did we do nine? I know you moved it, but I don't think we ever did it. We switched eight and nine. So we'll, after we do seven, we'll do nine and then eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I just wanted to remind you, don't forget nine. No, no, no. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. Uh, this is uh, item number seven we're on is a, uh, a request from the grand jury for regarding the grand jury report. Um, board members, President Gibson, this item is in regards to this past April, the Marin County Grand Jury released a report entitled Follow-Up Report on Web Transparency of Agency Compensation Practices. And I did want to share throughout that report, which is attached to the staff report, the district MMWD was identified as a model, as a great example for all the agencies throughout the county in our longstanding practices of how we report transparently board compensation. In which is typically the case in these grand jury reports, there are certain findings and recommendations they asked agencies to respond to. Attached is a proposed response where we would send it out shortly to the grand jury responding to one finding and two recommendations. The first finding was um, asked of all agencies um, in regards to um, the, the practices of many agencies are not as transparent as a grand jury thought would be ideal. Specifically noting 
as we do in our response, we, we remind the jury um, that for this item, we were noted as an example in the grand jury report. So we certainly um, agree with this finding. We had also a recommendation the grand jury asked us to respond to, to incorporate a link on our webpage that goes directly to the county's elected officials page and um, noting precisely where they wanted that link to go. And we did that immediately following receipt of the grand jury report. And lastly, recommendation six that I believe was asked of all agencies no later than a date certain to adopt a practice, to compile and publish in some detail in regards to transparency of compensation. Our response, we um, noted it had been implemented. And in fact, we had a longstanding practice as was acknowledged within the grand jury report of doing this. So um, I'm interested at this time, if you have any comments on this response now or shortly, you could send them to me because we do need to get this response off to the grand jury. Good. Good. A quick comment then. Um, I, I just think you're to be congratulated in the team. Transparency has always been a high priority and a value for the board and the district, but I think this is, um, this is important and impressive um, you know, testament to the success that we've had. So congratulations to you for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other board comment? Do we have any public comment on this item? Not have any public comment on this item. Okay, it's uh, not an approval item. So uh, we can move on to uh, now we'll cover number nine, the future agenda schedule. Uh... Oh, yes. Um, so this reflects our um, upcoming board meeting and committee meeting schedule. Um, as I had um, talked about with President Gibson, um, we are canceling Thursdays, this coming Thursday's finance committee and the reason for that deals with the need to year in reconcile the books and bring a accurate June report that would reflect the fiscal year full accurate auditable reconciliation and that'll be forthcoming. Um, aside from that, we're on schedule for all as calendared all upcoming board and committee meetings and um, just a light reminder for um, staff is working on the board annual retreat in September. Right. right. Uh, now the last I saw the annual retreat in September was a tentative date. Is that been firmed up as much as it can be firmed up today? Yes, it has. Okay, thank you. Um, any board comments or questions uh, on future agenda items? Any public comment on future agenda items? President Gibson, we do have one hand raised. Okay. Um, so I'll go back to Bert Barsh. Um, oh, yeah. And just a reminder to the members of the public, uh, public comment is restricted to one item, uh, one minute, excuse me. Um, and Bert Barsh, uh, is this comment related to item number nine? Huh. I'm sorry, it was actually related to the last item, but I couldn't find the Zoom button to comment. So uh, <laughs> I'll, lower, I'll lower my hand. Yeah, okay. All right. We'll be back to you. Um, there is no additional public comments. Okay. Uh, now, uh, are we doing open time now or after number uh, eight, item eight? I, I believe after item eight is. Okay, good. Then that takes us to the last item on our agenda other than uh, open time. Uh, and that's uh, discussion on uh, uh, an update on e-bikes. Um, I, I'd like to briefly kick this item off and then I'll hand it over to Sean Horn, our watershed manager. Uh, th this is an item, uh, part of our ongoing, um, working through with the public and the board, this um, rather complex and challenging issue. There is no um, staff recommendation there is no request and there will not be any board action tonight on this item. 
I expect um, we're some months away before we bring this item to the board um, for a decision with a staff recommendation. We, um, as you will see as part of Sean's presentation, um, we are um, proposing to take another um, fairly intensive effort to engage key stakeholder groups on this item. And we anticipate doing that in advance of the next board update. So um, the board and the public can expect uh, a fair number of these updates coming prior to any recommendation and very likely um, it will be as it has been a bit of an evolving process going forward. Okay. And yeah. there, there was, I did want to just touch, um, I, I think um, some wording in the staff report suggested kind of a quick jump or um, due to the nature of the Zoom or the summer um, rushing this item. Um, as you'll see in the background in Sean's presentation, um, that really is far from our intent. Um, we've had um, a workshop uh, quite a while ago, ongoing discussions with members of the public, a intensive community advisory committee, and um, from staff's view, the process and discussion is continuing, and all the information and all the comments to date are posted on our website, and we anticipate continued engagement and hearing from the public for some months to come. <laughs> with that, Sean. All right, good evening, board members. Sean Horn, Watershed Resource Manager. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Just give me one second. So tonight's update is on e-bikes and we have put a presentation together for all of you that summarizes the summarizes the staff report as well as the attachment to the staff report, which is the e-bike assessment. Um, so we're briefly gonna go over the district's regulations and the state laws relating to e-bikes. We'll do an overview of the process to date, and then we'll introduce um, a proposed three-tier approach to addressing e-bike access on the watershed. Um, we've broken this down to watershed user support framework, as well as the specific options for e-bike access. And then also we're presenting a concept of a watershed sustainable use plan, which you can think as a much longer term planning effort to look at all um, watershed users as a whole. And then we also have a plan for public outreach to present this three-tiered approach to different stakeholder groups. And then we'll present the next steps for tonight. From tonight. Um, so currently the Marin Municipal Water District regulates e-bikes under our motor vehicle code. As the code is currently written, motorized bicycles are prohibited on the district's lands. Currently we have regulation signs that clearly um, denote this and show that e-bikes are not allowed on the watershed. <clears throat> As of October of 2019, Assembly Bill 1096 was signed, which um, was a state law that identified e-bike class one and two as bicycles. However, in that law, it also noted that public agencies may adopt rules or regulations to restrict or specific establish specific conditions for e-bike access. Um, as a local public agency, MMWD can decide how to regulate e-bikes that's in line with the district's watershed management objectives. Um, to date, we've gone through a fairly exhaustive process as Ben was mentioning, and we intend to continue this as we um, evolve this concept and approach and move it forward. In December of 2018, we had an e-bike public workshop and listening session where we heard from different community groups about their position on e-bike access in the watershed. From there, we took an, we heard a number of themes that came out of that workshop. In May, of four, May 14, 2019, the board of directors approved the formation of a community advisory committee, which identified 10 individuals to participate um, over the period of eight months to evaluate the different themes that came out of the workshop. From September through April, we held seven meetings to evaluate those topics and brought in topical experts where appropriate to help us evaluate um, different groups had about e-bike access on the watershed. Um, May 12, 2020, we presented an e-bike summary report that have, uh, presented the themes that came out of the discussion from the community advisory committee um, and really identified a number of options and approaches that this district could take in e-bike access on the watershed. Since that time, staff has been refining some of the options that were discussed and 
taken um, some of the discussion points that were heard from the public and the board and developed this three-tiered approach that's presented in the e-bike assessment tonight. So the three-tiered approach has three elements that you can um, think about as near-term um, being watershed user support framework. These were topics that came out of our discussion with the community while we were looking at the e-bike access question and elements that didn't specifically address access of e-bikes in the watershed. The second tier specifically um, focuses on the options for e-bike access. And then the third tier really looks long-term at how we might wanna think about um, watershed use generally and bring some important points that were raised during the conversation forward. And we'll be presenting this um, at future board meetings to have more discussion on how this approach might look for the district. With that, I'm gonna go into this first tier of this approach, um, which is the education and outreach program. And we've talked about this in relation to increased use relating to COVID, but also it relates to our e-bike discussion, which is ending our watershed ambassador program to include a watershed greeter and trail ambassador program. Um, and also advancing some partnerships within the community with cycling groups, high school mountain bike teams, and environmental groups. As part of this outreach effort, we think there would be benefit to start promoting the use of bells and speedometers on the watershed. So one of the concepts is to actually purchase a number of these and start providing them at our outreach events to the community that's using our watershed to promote the use of them. We know that other groups are doing this and we think that's a good thing and that the district could um, help bolster that effort in general. We also acknowledge and um, have learned that partnerships are critical to this effort and the slow and say hello campaign has been essential to building trust and collaboration among different user groups. And so the district sees uh, a need to expand that relationship and some of the events on the watershed in the immediate near term. And then longer term, look at kind of some strategic options for how we can further enhance that program and support it. So in regards to our education and outreach, the next steps are really developing the framework that's specific to this watershed creator program. Um, we'll roll that out with staff initially, and we actually have our first event planned for this Friday, August 31st, so next Friday. Um, and we'll be partnering with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, one TAM as well, as they bring back their outreach staff. And then in the future, we see this expanding to volunteer um, activities and events. So partnering with some of those cycling groups to actually have volunteers participate once we have the model down. And then purchasing bells and speedometers, that's something that we can do in the near term to help um, kind of bolster our outreach efforts and promote the use of those on the watershed. And then as I mentioned, continuing our partnership with the Slow and Say Hello campaign and pursuing deeper discussions about long-term strategies for the watershed and potential increased funding support to not only increase the number of watershed events annually, but also other um, kind of outreach opportunities that might come that would be beneficial to all of our users. So in addition, under our first tier, we also acknowledge that watershed signage can be improved. And specifically, we have a gap in our messaging relating to trail etiquette. So we wanna expand our watershed signage um, on our messaging around trail etiquette. And we wanna do this to foster tolerance, understanding, and respect amongst user groups. We appreciate and understand that signs alone won't solve this problem or um, some of the longstanding issues between users, but we think that it can really help in just informing people about how we can um, all be respectful and why we're using the watershed. So we also think that expanding some of our slow zones would be really important and helpful and just generally um, improving how users experience the watershed. And we've mapped out some of the slow zones that are already on the watershed on the map, which is in yellow, our existing slow zones, and then some areas where we wanna expand these, which are in orange. And so segments of these orange lines would be um, yellow. We've heard from the community that with our slow zones, we should also be um, signing where they begin and end. And so that would be part of this signage process. So the next steps in regards to watershed, watershed signage is to develop that trail etiquette messaging, which we're currently working on with our communications department. As we go out and do the public outreach pro, um, approach, we'll be reviewing that messaging with stakeholders and then looking at designing and printing those signs and installing them on the watershed in select locations. And you can think of this messaging being at our major kiosks and that'll, that'll focus on kind of the regulations and the trail etiquette generally, and then some targeted signs throughout the watershed that kind of look like these yield, um, share the trail, respect other users signage, and then the slow zone signs as well. Mm -hmm. So in addition to signage, we acknowledge that enhanced enforcement is an important element that can help us um, kind of improve watershed use generally. And as part of that, 
enhanced enforcement, we want to consider increasing closures and restoration of non-system trails on the watershed. Um, this is something we do through our project restore program. So we'd be looking at expanding that. Sean, um, I'm, Sean I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but you're, you're cutting, you're, you're a little choppy. Okay. Um, um, any way you can maybe get a little bit closer to the mic? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And if I have to, I can switch computers real quick. Um, so we could also evaluate new ordin ordin ordinances for speeding and slow zones. We currently do not have an ordinance for speeding in a slow zone. So that's something that we could expand as we expand slow zones, actually developing an ordinance that would allow rangers to enforce that. Um, we could also increase speed monitoring in our high use downhill areas, as well as in our new slow zones. And then consider increasing fines for e-bikes and bikes generally on trails. So the bottom table identifies the fine structure that we currently have. Our base fine for first offense is $35. Most of the fees actually come from the court fees. So looking at um, expanding and increasing some of those to descent to um, use of trails by bikes, any bikes. We could also consider increasing fines for um, bikes and users generally in closed areas. So if we close an area off for a project restore, looking at actually increasing a fine for people that are going into those areas because that is one of our major constraints in keeping those areas closed is folks continuing to use an area that we've done and invested resources in restoring. The next steps in regards to enforcement is to develop some revisions to our current regulations and our fines. Um, review those options with the board and also consider um, discussions regarding staff capacity in general for the watershed. Um, we'd also propose then we'd take the next step of updating watershed regulations and promoting those regulations generally among the community. So the three elements being outreach, signage, and enforcement kind of make up our first tier, which is our watershed use support framework. All of these elements were discussed generally during our e-bike CAC and during other public processes and really um, expand beyond just the e-bike question itself. So we wanted to separate those out and put those in our first tier for this approach. The second approach really dives into this question and um, about e-bike access and the different options that we have. So based on the discussions that we've been having and the development of the different options, we have um, a first option, which be, would be conditional allowance of e-bikes, which would be essentially establishing conditions around access. We could think about these in a number of ways, but considering allowing e-bikes on all fire roads while establishing one or two days a week where no bikes were allowed on the watershed, or establishing alternating days of the week where e-bikes are allowed. Um, we could also consider allowing e allowing access to a limited number of fire roads. Um, and there's a number of models throughout the state of organizations and agencies restricting access in some way. And so we could continue to develop different considerations and options for having conditions to access for e-bikes. This would also include revising our relevant codes to strictly prohibit the use of e-bike rentals on the watershed as well as restricting e-bike access on red flag days. So some of the considerations um, to take in for this approach is that it will take users some time to learn new regulations if we make changes to bikes generally, um, as well as e-bikes. Closing the watershed one or two days a week to all bikes may cause concern among some community groups um, and separating the users may get to the root of the problem. And so <clears throat> for each of these different um, approaches and options, we've developed pros and cons lists. These aren't comprehensive, but they get to the essence of each of the um, pros and cons of the different approaches that we wanted to present to the board. So the conditional allowance would really facilitate inclusive access and encourages diverse users on the watershed. It protects other users through establishing some controls. Um, it also is adaptable over time and could evolve as we um, see necessary and have adjustments that could be made to better support our users. Um, it could be designed to separate some user groups to ensure access and safe, ac safe access for other user groups. Um, some of the cons that we brought forward on this one is it will create more trail restrictions that may be confusing to some user groups. Um, it may not align with other jurisdictions and that's broadly true with all of these options. Um, broad agreement on an acceptable condition will be challenging and potential for increased traffic on fire roads as we allow e-bikes would be something to be um, considered and thought through. It could be difficult to enforce some of these conditions as well. So these are just kind of considerations generally for the conditional allowance approach. The next approach that we um, discussed is no e-bike access. This would 
essentially align with our current regulations and it would ban um, e-bikes from the watershed and reaffirm the passive recreation for the protection of the water quality and natural resources. Some of the considerations for this is um, it does not Im Im support inclusive access. It may not align with our neighboring land management agencies approaches. Um, it will be difficult for some users who may unintentionally um, have violations to our regulations as they cross between neighboring lands. Um, and it really does not facilitate access for diverse users, but it would align with our current regulations. So the pros of this is it really does maintain the commitment to non-motorized use on the watershed. It establishes strict controls on user types. The focus is on access for existing user groups, and it would restrict overall use of the watershed to protect resources. However, as mentioned, it does not facilitate inclusive access. Um, this would potentially be difficult to enforce um, and restricting access to a growing user group in the interest of existing user groups would be a difficult question to think through. And it's not an adaptive solution and doesn't acknowledge the changing needs of our users within the community. So the third option that we have is an open access approach. This would be essentially treating e-bikes as regular bicycles under the district bicycle code. <clears throat> the district would update the bicycle code to allow for class one and class two e-bikes, and it would restrict e-bike access on red flag days. Mm -hmm. um, an e-bike open access approach would support diverse users, but it, would, it could potentially significantly increase future use. And I think that's something we need to con continue to bring up and think about in terms of the e-bike access. Um, as we open access, it would be hard to go back and restrict future access if we did see a large increase in users. So that's something to be considering. The pros is this really does support inclusive access. It encourages outdoor activities for diverse user groups. It aligns with the state guidelines regarding bicycles and it recognizes that <clears throat> it's the rider's behavior and not the type of bike that results in code violations often. The cons is this could increase watershed use and could impact other users as we see more e-bikers on the watershed. Um, it could have unanticipated consequences associated with future usage. It could um, create some community concerns within the regard to impacts to natural resources, and it may create some safety issues on the watershed as more users are using our trail and road network. So the fourth option that we've presented um, and we've outlined here again in more detail is the option for a registration program. This would essentially establish a fee for service model for e-bikes. The district code would be revised to allow for citations to be issued for non-registered e-bikes. Um, the district could choose to administer this program ourselves or partner with bicycle shops to administer the program. Um, and the district could restrict e-bike rentals and access on red flag days. We've done a kind of skeleton sketch up of the costs that might be associated with this registration program. And these costs were developed thinking what would be necessary to create a sustainable program into the future to ensure that the registration process was effective and meaningful. Um, without some of these elements, it would be difficult to actually administer this successfully and in the long-term um, approach. So some considerations regarding the fee, and you can see this in the e-bike access assessment, is that it will be difficult to come up with a fee structure um, that generates enough revenue for the cost of a program. So this could be a very costly effort and it may not be as successful as other approaches. Um, it will be difficult to enforce and it will take staff time. And that staff time will mean that rangers will be responding. It will take rangers time away from responding to other issues at times. So some of the pros of this is it really does support inclusive access while establishing a, a, establishing a fee for service model that allows the district to control some of this use and evaluate capacity as we um, administer the registrations. It could establish a partnership with um, bicycle shops generally to help with that registration process, but it does create accountability for users. So that's something that would be beneficial to the program. It's gonna be difficult to enforce the registration broadly. Um, it will require kind of staff support in a number of ways, administrative, administrative and enforcement, um, operational impacts associated with managing <clears throat> The enfor in enforcing the program will be significant and it creates a DMV type system for the watershed. And just to be clear, a registration program, this really is similar to what Mount Tamarancho has and is different from when e-bikes have 
um, a registration sticker classifying the type of e-bike. So this would really be about access to the district's watershed lands through a registration process. So the third tier really is about the watershed sustainable use plan. And this is a longer term uh, concept that we're bringing forward and intend to have future discussions about. And it really acknowledges that it's not one user group that has an impact on the watershed, but all user groups collectively. And we need to think about how we manage these users as a whole and how we um, preserve and maintain our infrastructure to support that use. So there's a number of different models for similar types of plans. A sustainable use plan is an aspirational concept and would take some deep thinking um, and a process to figure out with our community and our stakeholders. The general outline might look like a framework for monitoring watershed use generally. It could include an adaptive watershed access plan, so how we review um, different user groups on a fairly frequent basis. It could include um, an analysis of our infrastructure and some of our restorative operations to support the natural resources that we have and the users that come to um, enjoy those. And then it would evaluate community partnerships and engagement, and then watershed staff resources and capacity to carry out some of the concepts within the plan. So at this point, this is really just a conceptual um, component of the three-tiered approach, but we'll be continuing to bring it forward for further refinement and discussion. But we do think based on the e-bike CAC process and discussions we've been having with the community, having these three tiered um, elements makes sense because it allows us to address some things in the near term that supports all watershed use, allows us to evaluate and continue to consider the actual question about e-bike access. And then it looks to the future about how we might want to engage in the planning process to support watershed use generally. So the next step um, in regards to public is we want to start to outreach to a number of um, stakeholders and present this three-tiered approach and take additional comment and then begin to refine that approach further before we bring it back. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna be targeting land management agencies to have a specific discussion about their future um, access options and approaches. Looking at local nonprofits and community groups for further comment on this approach, and then also connecting with private industry to discuss some of these options. So in terms of next steps for the three-tiered approach, um, the user watershed user support framework, we can begin working on our outreach and our signage and our partnerships. That's something that we're currently working on and we'll continue to expand. Um, we'll continue to evaluate enforcement options and bring forward um, further, consider, further options for the board to consider um, making changes to those. And then together, you know, these elements really will work to foster that tolerance, understanding, that support framework is really meant to um, assist in whichever option the board chooses regarding e-bike access generally. So in regard to the second tier, we'll continue developing the options and we'll take the input that we received from tonight's discussion in the community outreach plan that we put together and further refine this three-tiered approach. And then in regards to the watershed sustainable use plan, as I mentioned, we'll continue to do research on different recreation plans that other agencies have but with the thinking that the water district is very unique in terms of being primarily um, a water district that provides water to the community, but also provides recreation that's unique here in California. And we'll keep an eye on that as we do this research and we'll bring back a future outline for what this could be um, developed into for further discussion. And then we'll be outreaching after tonight's meeting to the number of stakeholder groups to start to obtain um, set up meetings to actually present this three-tiered approach and actually have discussions and take additional feedback from them. And we'll refine this approach based on that feedback. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it back to the board for any discussion and questions that you might have on this three-tiered approach assessment generally. To jump in quickly, Sean, that was a, a great presentation. Can you remind us where things stand with the, um, uh, you know, the Citizens Advisory Committee that's been meeting for the last, I want to say, over a year, right? Or getting close to a year? Yeah, so we've wrapped the Community Advisory Committee up. We've developed a summary report. That's all available online um, on the district's website, every one of the meetings and the meeting materials, as well as the final report. And that's been concluded. And then we're basically building off of the input that we've received in that summary report to develop this kind of three-tiered approach moving forward. So when you say you're going to be reaching out to stakeholders, I assume those are going to include, maybe not in a formal way, but they're going to include um, the folks who served on that committee. I think they're 
my impression is that they were all very committed and very engaged. So it would just be useful to hear how you're going to be um, building on that process for this next round of public input that you're seeking. Yeah, I think many of those people sit on some of the um, stakeholder groups that we've identified in our assessment that we'd be targeting and outreaching to. We could also think about doing a, a presentation just to that group um, for them to have further input on this three-tiered approach that's come out of that process. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting we necessarily need to reconvene them. It's just when you're talking yeah. about stakeholders, they certainly are, they have a certainly have a stake in the in the holding. So okay. Any other board questions or comments? I have some comments. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. That was really good. I'm just going to go down a, a short list and mention a few things. Um, I think when you talked about education and outreach, that was, that was really good. And I appreciate you bringing up one TAM as one of the partners there. And having managed volunteer programs, those are really hard to oversee. And having a partner like one TAM that can actually manage and train volunteers is really a cheap or an inexpensive, it's a valuable an inexpensive service that actually is a force multiplier for the district. And it's a significant one, I think, or represents a significant opportunity. Um, thank you very much about the section where you talked about messaging. Um, I really appreciated the work that you did on that. It was great to see the word respect in large letters on there that basically said, everybody's got to, re it looked like it said, in essence, everybody's got to respect everybody on these lands, which was great. Um, a question, and that is, do you follow or have you looked at the International Mountain Biking Association trail guide on how to design trails that are used by bikes? I'm sure you have, I'm just asking it. Yeah, we've referenced that before. And I think it would be something we could, you know, really reference in more detail in a watershed sustainable use plan long term. Yeah, because there's been a lot of work that's been done there. And as we all know, the fire roads and the trails on the mountain were carved by bulldozers and others who were not thinking about these future uses. And so there are um, plans and strategies that will reduce impact on trail systems based on how you build them. Um, and also I wanted to mention, when you, when you mentioned, Sean, that we are a water district, not a, you know, like a, not a park, um, you guys know that Mount Tam is a biodiversity hotspot, you know, so, uh, and also the waters that flow into the watershed are not just watershed lands, coming up watershed lands. They, there's water coming off of state park lands and others. And um, I just want to point out that there is a new deputy director in the um, California Natural Resources Agency, and it's a deputy director for biodiversity and habitat. And there's going to be an additional focus on how we are maintaining lands like this. So I would encourage that um, understanding that it's a watershed, we really need to be emphasizing, I think that what we want, what we're interested in is a healthy watershed, you know, um, because it, it implies we're not interested in this other stuff, we're just interested in the water production. And I think that there's an important messaging opportunity there. Um, Thank you for the sections that you went through. And you did, men I just want to make sure I understood you. You did mention that you're cooperating with the other land managers on the mountain in terms of talking how these plants could mesh together. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think what our next, or for our next approach is really to outreach to those land managers and set up a meeting to have a focused discussion around this. We've generally been having discussions throughout the entire process with them, but I think now we're at a point where we need to convene them and lead that conversation. I think with all the attorneys in the room, it would seem like it would be a tough issue to cite a cyclist who can then show in the court that it's confusing as hell, which land you're on as you're riding around on Mount Tam or even walking on Mount Tam. And so I think that as much as we can align and support each other in terms of agencies, it's going to be better for the public and it's better for enforcement. It's going to let you know, and I know that that's where you're headed is to reduce confusion and improve understanding. And I appreciate that very much. Um, and then here's a tough question. What's the data that we have on all the different users and the impacts of all these different users? We've not done a focused study on impacts of users. So I think that's the long-term strategy of a watershed sustainable use plan really would encompass that kind of evaluation of the patterns of different use and 
the impacts of all users. And, you know, and, and, and I'll be a little facetious here in saying that, you know, engineers would not put together, uh, you know, a utility plan without understanding exactly what the numbers are. And, um, and this will lead to my sort of my last comment. And I think that's gonna be really important for the district and the other land managers to get together and really come up with some baseline information that we really, that we can really talk about in terms of understanding what the increase, what the changes in use are. We don't know what that is. And one of my concerns is an underlying premise in this, to me really sounds anecdotal. You know, we, not everybody on the screen here goes to the watershed regularly, a few folks here do. And um, I have a tough time trying to conceptualize what the whole district looks like, what the whole watershed looks like at any given moment. And so I think it's gonna be really important for us to figure out a way to understand what's actually happening on the whole watershed. And, and so this will bring me to my next point. And that is that um, when you mentioned the cost of a permitted program, um, and I, again, I'm gonna be a little facetious. I thought that the costs relative to a dedicated ranger and a ranger vehicle for e-bikes was a red herring, frankly, because it, that's a huge cost. That's $410,000 for those two things. But how can you say that that's what that's gonna cost because of e-bikes when we don't have the statistics of what all the other users are and the other impacts? And so I think we have to be really careful about assigning costs to something that we cannot defend, you know, or support really. Um, and then, so when you take out $410,000 from that, that number, you know, suddenly it becomes $46,000 to manage a permit program on the mountain. And, and I would say that the level of use on the mountain beyond e-bikes already demands that we increase our staffing up there. You know, so I just want to, I think we just need to be careful because you know, there's a lot of people looking at this and, um, and I really wanna see us do the right thing. And it's gonna take, and I really appreciate the level of work that you've done, Sean. So I'm not being critical, you know, I understand the constraints that you're operating under in terms of this is where we are now. Um, but in moving ahead, I just, I'll stop there. But thank you, that was a really good report. So I'm not being, yeah, right. Anyway, thanks so much. Okay, any other uh, board comments or questions? Uh -huh. um, if I may? Yep, please. Um, just to follow up on uh, Armando's comment about costs, and uh, perhaps our attorney can weigh in at some point, but <clears throat> my understanding under Prop 218 is permitting fees and costs have to be directly related to the cost of the permitting or fee itself. So I, I do agree with Armando conceptually that even though we may need that extra enforcement up there at this point because of the volume of visitors, um, I don't know if it's gonna uh, pass legal muster to try to tie those costs to the permitting. Um, I think we may need to go to some kind of permit uh, process in the future um, for accountability purposes, but you know I don't think we need to to go there right now or to move too fast on that. Um, I've had a permit for Tamarancho. It is a much smaller facility than we're dealing with. Um, the permit is very informal. You send them a check, they give you a little tag to put on your bike and you're permitted. So it's a very simple, inexpensive way to go. Um, the e-bike technology presents a lot of challenges for us. Uh, it's very difficult to tell an e-bike from a regular bike, let alone class one, class two, class three. So, uh, you know, we, at some point, if we're gonna make e-bike uh, access official, uh, we may need to go to some kind of a permitting system if only to enforce class one and class two. Mm -hmm. um, the other elephant in the room is Americans with Disabilities Act. 
Um, E-bikes may be other powered mobility devices. Uh, during the uh, CAC um, proceedings, there was a lot of compelling testimony from residents about the beneficial uh, health benefits of e-bikes. And it wasn't only just orthopedic or age oriented. Uh, one of the more compelling stories I heard was from the mother of a young uh, child who um, was somewhere on the spectrum um, of autism and the e-bike allowed this youth to get out and get exercise. I mean, it was really quite moving to, to mm -hmm. hear it. It was very unexpected. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of subtleties that we really need to consider here. Um, I've always had, a, honestly, sort of a little bit of resentment because e-bikes for a regular biker uh, you know, the e-bike, they don't earn their elevation. You know, they're not working like a regular biker is. But, you know, as I've gone through it and gotten into dialogue with folks, you know, I, I, I must say I've, I've, I've kind of softened on that. Um, I was out Sunday up on Eldridge. I probably saw 10 e-bikes. So I would say, you know, probably of two, two, three hours up there, a third of the bikes may have been e-bikes. Um, so um, it, it is a much more complicated uh, issue than it, it, uh, at, you may think of it at, at first appearance. Um, one other thing, um, I saw one of the emails in tonight's uh, packet at page 24 from Ryan Murphy, which I thought presented a pretty good idea about uh, maybe separating user groups. And it was a very, it's a very simple proposal. It's at page 24 of the packet uh, that Cherise sent us and it's from Ryan Murphy. And, uh, what Ryan suggested is that you designate certain trails odd and certain trails even so that the, the bikes would use the odd trails on odd days and the even trails on even days, but everybody would have access all the time. It's just, I thought it was sort of a very ingenious way of, of rationing out trail use and separating folks out a little bit. So it's just something I wanted to bring to the board's attention. Um, the other thing, like I said, is I think the ADA issue is, is, a, is a very significant and profound issue. And do we have an ADA uh, policy out there? Our, our current approach is to work through this issue and on the heels, we would come up with an ADA policy for the board. That said, in the intervening time, we are complying with the federal statute. Um, if someone indicates we have a process where um, we do allow um, e-bikes for ADA use. And as you noted, um, there's bikes up there that aren't necessarily e-bikes, um, ADA at this point in time as we work through this issue. So what happens if, if a ranger stops somebody on an e-bike and the person says, I have, I have a disability or I'm, I'm allowed to do this. What, what is the procedure? Right, so in compliance with the law, we um, allow them to continue on their path. As this process evolves and the board decides on certain restrictions, we plan to dovetail a um, probably more detailed and written policy on how to handle that to support the work of the Rangers in line with the thinking of the board. 
Okay, thank you for the information. And just final comment, I think the phase one program that you've outlined is really a good start. I think creating that culture of respect uh, is so important on a lot of levels, respect between user groups, respect between all people that, that come to that space. And I think we should be really directly uh, giving some giving folks, whether it is a sign, whether it's at a kiosk, whether it's a little handout of the <clears throat> rules of the road, like you get at Tamarancho. Um, I think these are very sort of low tech, inexpensive things that we can be doing that are gonna start to create this culture that we really need to uh, encourage. So thank you. I, I think it's a very, you know, it's it's a very tough subject, much tougher than it appears. And I appreciate your work and, and everything you've you've put together. Okay. Any other? Yes, Cynthia. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I, I wanted to circle back to something Armando said. I think it's worth <laughs> I don't think that was me, that wasn't me. <laughs> but it was very exciting. Um, <laughs> so thanks for sharing what it was. Um, I wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> the dance break. Okay, <laughs> are we ready to go? <laughs> Better talk fast. Okay. Uh, I wanted to um, circle back to something Armando said, because I think it's important that we not swing past it too fast. Um, so as I said earlier, Sean, I do think that your approach, the three tiers, um, you know, are very thoughtful. I think they're, they're a great framework for moving forward. Um, I think the status of the mountain as um, a biodiversity, um, you know, you know, a recognized uh, you know, the importance of it as a biodiversity hotspot is enormously important. And I am, um, I think it's important that we elevate that in this conversation. So access is important. All of those other things are important, but the watershed itself is also important. And, you know, there are, um, it's a big mountain. There's a lot of opportunities on it. And I do think that our special responsibility to that biodiversity, to that ecosystem is something that I'd like to see it a little bit more elevated. Um, you know, I read through all of the comments in the in the packet, and the one if there's anything that has caused me some um, pause, you know, some concern in this is that I have not seen to the level I think we really need to to resolve this problem um, an embrace of that in the people who are engaged in this. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the parties are still very much talking directly past each other. Um, you know, some are talking exclusively about about access, and there's not a lot of, if any, um, understanding about our role as a watershed, as a water district, the role of the watershed, its importance as a biodiversity hotspot. And that's, that's concerning because I think to move forward, to get to whichever answer we're going to get to, um, we're going to all as stakeholders need to engage. We can't continue to have people simply talking past each other and making the points they want to make while not addressing the legitimacy of, um, of everybody else's concerns. So, um, and, and that's the one that I think gets short shrift really. So um, I wanna make sure that that is brought in. And I, I think you're reflecting that somewhat in the sustainability, um, you know, the sustainability use plan, but I'm, I'm not sure that getting to, that, that keeping it in tier three is um, necessarily gonna address um, our responsibilities as stewards of the, uh, you know, of this watershed in the way in the way that I think we really need to, to be responsible. Okay, Armando. Yeah. Just uh, one comment on that point before we move on. I will just note that in the enforcement section, the idea of enhancing trail closures is really focused around that element of, you know, we have a legal use and it is backers and we have a program set up to restore some of these areas. And that's the intent to expand that was um, part of that second tier. I get that. It's just that that's in enforcement. So there's a whole 
a lot of people that are going to see enforcement and say no. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, so I, what I'm getting at is um, that we need to be talking about, I think, in a more positive way, right? So enforcement is fine, but we need to be talking in a more positive way. <laughs> Forces of evil. Yeah, you're a DJ today. Pretty heavy metal, whoever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd like to just make one. Yeah, go ahead, Armando. The anyway, got to be an e breaker. The comments that Larry Bragman and go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, sorry, just to finish that point before. All right. Again. Um, I, I'm so yeah, I I see that, Sean. I'm just saying. I think what I'm talking about is something a little different, which is we need to find a way of. If we're going to talk to our stakeholders, we need to bring our stakeholders into that. We yeah. need to, for the stakeholders to engage constructively, we need to find some ways of moving them off of, this is what I care about, and I'm gonna denigrate the things I don't care about because we're not going to get there. Um, I was just very struck by the, by the lack of engagement in the comments that I saw tonight. Um, the, the lack of any, really almost any, I shouldn't say, I don't wanna say it too extremely, but you know, there was very, very little acknowledgement about the legitimate concerns about watershed health. And, um, and I think that's a big part of, it needs to be a big part of the education that we bring to bear here. Yeah, thanks. The combination of comments from Cynthia and Larry Bragman actually created a visual for me, which was a t-shirt that says something like, respect the mountain and each other. You know, yeah. it's, it's sort of, that's, that's really, that, that's a, a winnowed version of what we're talking about. And, and, um, and I actually think something, even a statement like that has some emotion to it, which is with all of this, we, as you're saying, Cynthia, I think we need to trigger the positive emotions and engagement. So thank you guys. Those are good comments. Yeah. A lot of good comments. Thanks. Okay. Any other board comments? Um, I know we have public comments. So uh, uh, where'd Cherise go here? Jack. There you go. Yeah. Gibson. Yes. Um, we have public public comment, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just a reminder to members of the public um, who are joining us via Zoom, you may uh, comment by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you're using an iPad, I, I believe it may be located on the top right. Um, if you are joining by phone and you'd like to comment, you can press star nine and we will call on you as appropriate. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start the public comment. Um, sorry, before I do that, um, just a quick reminder to uh, members of the public that public comment is limited to one minute. Um, so uh, having said that, we're gonna go ahead and allow Bert Barsh to begin. Bert. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So. <clears throat> what I feel like right now is that it's like might makes right out there on the watershed. Whoever can go fastest, it owns the trail. And you know what that means. So you're walking along and you're trying to have a nice reflective time. Some guy comes up behind you, like on the bridge, where it says clearly who's, well, it used to say clearly, but those signs are no longer up. But it used to say clearly that pedestrians and, and horses have whatever. But the bikes don't do that. They just come at you three at a time. <clears throat> Maybe you're just having a like little moment where you want to be alone, but you are forced to interact with these guys and many of them are really aggressive. Now it's even worse when they come up behind you on e-bikes because they're really fast. And some of these guys are not really all together in their minds, clearly. There are a lot of people up there on those e-bikes that probably shouldn't be on a bike at all. I wouldn't even have them be on a non-motorized bike. For instance, my friend is now in an intensive care because he will never recover. This, I mean, one minute is not fair. After all this discussion, you give us one minute. Let me just say, it feels very disrespectful. Thank you. Um, and uh, the next comment we have is um, Robert Middlestadt. Um, Robert? Yes, thank you. I just want to say very briefly, I applaud Ben and Sean for
for their hard work and their responsiveness. And in light of Ben's clarification that the staff is not making a recommendation at this point, I'll defer my substantive comments until, until later. I, I wanna just say I remain hopeful that people of goodwill can work together and come up with an inclusive solution that doesn't ban bikes or doesn't ban e-bikes. I will say that I agree that we first need to identify the problem and then come up with the solution that it fixes that problem. Uh, and we need to get data. Uh, and I think one start would be a survey, perhaps by volunteers, so we have a baseline on what the use is on the mountain right now. Um, and finally, uh, you know, given the, the times that we're living through, the divisiveness that we see all around us, I think it's incumbent on all of us to lower the volume and to find an inclusive solution. And I will do my part to do that. Thank you. And next we have Rich Peterson. Rich Peterson. Good evening and uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you and uh, thanks to staff and the board for giving this matter such careful consideration. Uh, I just want to voice my support for the idea of uh, more outreach and education to create the a respectful environment that we all want um, and to very strongly uh, give my voice against, uh, you know, greater enforcement or anything that would would uh, restrict the use uh, of, of this great asset that we all enjoy in our backyard uh, and, and that we should be including as many people in that as possible. So I'll, with that, I'll yield it to the next person. Thank you. Next, we have Judy Schreibman. Judy? Hi, this is, yes, hi, this is Judy Schreibman. Um, uh, you've all received a letter board from the Marin Group of the Sierra Club regarding our opposition to motorized bikes or e-bikes on the watershed. And that letter lays out our environmental concerns with links to the science that supports our comments. So I'm not going to repeat those here. I do want to echo the board members who talked about the biodiversity hotspots being elevated in this conversation. I think that's key. I think that's where the Sierra Club is coming from as well, supporting the biolife, the wildlife and the plants that are on this mountain and nowhere else. Um, I'm also going to say I object to any changes as does the group in the current e-bike policy until the COVID crisis is over. At this time, your own staff as well as other marine open space staffers and rangers are really reluctant to patrol the space because of interactions with the public. So any rules or goals or ideas about enforcement at this time are pretty, are sheer fantasy. Um, and the enforcement before pre-COVID wasn't all that good either. So um, again, it, the general manager's report mentions that there were visitor impacts were up and two of the medical aid calls involve patients with critical head injuries Judy, that I, occurred I'm during starting. bicycle accidents. So this is, I, I fail to see how bringing more bikes into the watershed will be good at this time. I will send the rest of my comments by email. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Larry Minicus. Larry Minicus. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm entering my fourth hour. Thank you so much. I needed something to laugh about. <laughs> that was wonderful. And Armando and Cynthia, thank you so much for your comments on biodiversity. Be, be, even before you're going to say that, I was going. My comment was going to be, please give biodiversity and habitat a seat at the table. And that's what I felt. Sean, it was a wonderful presentation. Excellent. I just felt that was the piece that's missing. And if I may suggest, and I want to suggest it last time, but I ran out of time, and I'm not going to run out of time this time, is that they're using trail counters on Hun Camp Road. And I walked by it, and it can tell the difference between a bike, a hiker, or an equestrian. And you might want to speak to M M uh, Marin County Parks about this and install these, and it would be an excellent way to um, track um, usage. And with that, I'm past one minute. Thank you so much, folks, for uh, uh, an excellent presentation tonight. Thank you.
Next we have Janet Fitzgerald. Janet? All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right, great. Thank you. So I, I come into this discussion pretty late, so I'm sorry, I'm not up on every detail. So um, pardon me if this question is ignorant, but have, have you already defined or uh, laid out the difference between the pedal assist and the throttle bikes, the e-bikes? Has that already been discussed? Because, well, maybe not. Well, I, I was gonna ask how many of you had ever been on an e-bike um, I just got one three years ago when I moved here to Marin, and it's a pedal assist. Um, I have one of those stickers that I, I was told would allow me on all the trails. I thought, great. And I'll have to tell you, I, I, you know, I have a speedometer. I don't go any faster than any regular biker. Um, I'm way over 40, and I have uh, orthopedic issues and cholesterol and, and all, of, all of these things that um, being on a, a, an e-bike has allowed me to, to help take care of my health um, and be with my Drake High School mountain biker, uh, my daughter, Mimi, uh, which has been a thrill for me. It allows me to spend time with her. I help out with the team when I can too. But Janet, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, your, your minute's up. Okay, but it's because I have a, a, it's a pedal assist. It's very benign, but I would like to ask if any board members have ever been on one so that you can see it's, it's not, it, it does no harm. Happy to talk with any of you after, but I'd really like to know you know, if you've differentiated between. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have B. Rost. B. Rost. Um, thank you, and I want to uh, thank you on a very succinct presentation this evening. Um, regarding the different proposals about personal use of e bikes, I just want to underscore any bicycle on the water district land is already under conditional use. They are highly regulated by being limited to fire roads, fire roads which are designed for motor vehicles, true motor vehicles. And um, it seems that there's perhaps some reason that only e-bikes want to be under conditional use, not other users. And perhaps there's some underlying assumption that there is in fact something nefarious about bikes. Um, I, 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 attending most of the CAC meetings, there's been no evidence submitted, no credible evidence that demonstrates any environmental impact from e-bikes different from other bikes. And it seems to me that uh, what there is, is uh, people don't like them. And, and, and no doubt there are people, some people that misbehave. If there are people who are not acting properly and don't have wherewithal to uh, empathetically Ross. share the trails. That's where the target should be, not a class of vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara Salzman. Barbara? Uh, I'm sorry. Let's try this again, Barbara. Barbara, I'm sending you a request asking you to unmute. Um, I, okay. I think you should be able to speak now. Well, I can't. Uh, I can't see how to unmute. We can hear you now. You know you're, you're good. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, support what Cynthia said. That was my uh, immediate impression. That there was, there needs to be more attention paid to to the resources of the of the mountain, uh, the uh, wildlife and the vegetation. It isn't just a respect for the mountain. I think that doesn't, that doesn't really convey the value of the resources that are on it. So there needs to be a more complex message to match the, the complexity of the resources. And we, uh, anyway, we'll be continuing. We're in Audubon to look at this as we go along. You go along, thanks. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Next, we have um, Alex, um, Alex122503. Sorry about that, guys. My, I forgot to rename myself. I couldn't do it, but I'll just say uh, I want to be very brief. I'm an e-bike rider. This is the third or fourth MMWD uh, public hearing that I've attended. 
uh, first one online, but I've been to some of the ones in there. I just want to say I appreciate the thoughtfulness that all of you are bringing to the conversation and the process. It seems like it's evolving. And I play by the rules. I feel like I ride safer on my e-bike, probably because I'm pushing my, I'll be 59 in, in, uh, in August. So, you know, but um, I ride safe. I play by the rules. I think if we all play by the rules, it'll be fine. I love the sign that has the horses first, then the hikers, then the bikers. And thank you all. I hope we can all share the mountain, including us e-bike riders. Thank you very much for listening to my comment. Thank you. And, uh, before I go over to the next comment, I would just like to remind members of the public that they can email their comments um, into board, board comments at marinwater.com and it will be posted online and provided to the board of directors. Um, uh, so just to clarify, that's marinwater.org. Marin my apologies. Um, next, we have uh, Philip Pillsbury. Hello, everyone. I've been a longtime conservationist. I was head of the Yosemite Conservancy for many years. I've been a member of the Sierra Club. I am an e-biker and I'm 71. I have ridden up the, bike, up, up the road. I've ridden up Eldridge, uh, maybe even with Larry Bragman. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I am a cautious person. The folks that I ride with are cautious. And I can tell you that we respect the watershed. We ride on a hard road, a fire road. I respect that there are people that may be concerned about bikes being ridden too quickly. There, are, there is a process for that. But the process is not to ban bikes. The process is not to ban e-bikes. When I go to these, these presentations, I see over and over seniors that have been on conventional bikes and now need e-bikes to get up the mountain. I think that has to be respected as part of the community that uses this mountain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Laura Sheraton. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. I wanted to thank Cynthia and Armando for bringing up the biodiversity issues. Um, and for the others who brought them forth, um, I did feel that that was missing from the staff report. So thank you for that. Um, a colleague of mine from the Sierra Club and I am in the Watershed Alliance of Marin um, did a, a comprehensive survey of the fire road going from the uh, Throckmorton Ridge Fire Station up to uh, West Point Inn and then up from um, Pantall um, to the same place and then up to uh, Ridgecrest. Um, and what I wanna say is that there's an enormous amount of degradation that's occurring on the fire road. And um, we counted approximately 75 locations that had serious damage caused by mountain bikers and e-bikers um, taking out uh, eyebrows higher and higher as well as jumps and other things. The fire road is much wider than it has ever been. Bicyclists who- Lauren, if I can please ask you to conclude. Okay, I just wanna say, I will be presenting that information to you uh, and I have photographs, thank you. Next we have David Jacobson. David Jacobson. Thank you, can you hear me this evening? We can, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Uh, also, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Um, I am a 60 plus year old resident of Marin County my entire life. Recently got an e-bike because I was severely injured and could no longer ride. Um, having come to these meetings, I did my own informal survey that I'd like to share with you. I've surveyed 17 riders of e-bikes on the mountain over the last few months during the COVID. And most of them report to me, all of them actually report to me that they're over the age of 60, that they're aware of the rules and regulations to be courteous and that they try and extend those courtesies um, as much as they can to the hikers and other users. And that they all have found that this is beneficial to them in two ways, one in their health, physical health and two in their mental health. So thank you very much. 
And I hope that you continue to take everyone's feedback. And most importantly, um, we all have a deep respect for this mountain, for all those that live here, and we all got to work together to take care of it. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Kelly. Michael Kelly. Okay, I'm here now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for this great input that we've been going through for several months. Uh, I should point out, by the way, that I'm a 77 year old e bike rider and I've been able to continue riding bikes. I've been riding for 40 years. I can continue riding, which is very important. I'm not an additional mountain biker on this ride. Um, I want to say first that we have a group, uh, if you're going to be talking to stakeholders, please include the Electric Mountain Bicycling uh, Access Group uh, as one, because these are people who know a lot about this issue. The second thing I want to say in this short time is that I actually like Cynthia Kohler's remarks about biodiversity. I'm totally in favor of that. I've been a Sierra Club member since 1983 this time and before that as well. It's very important that we get together and that's why we go to this mountain because of the biodiversity. We love that, that's why we do. The best birder I know happens to be a mountain biker. Uh, the, and I also wanna say that Let's build a community as we decide how to deal with this. I agree. Let's not talk over and at each other. Let's do it by community. Michael, if you can please conclude. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'll submit my remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, Next, we have uh, Larry Kushner. Larry Kushner. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just try and rush through this. I've been of attending your meeting since 2018 in August, which is pretty much when this all started. And I commend you guys for sticking with it and hopefully we'll get somewhere with this. Uh, I qualify under Ben's uh, ADA uh, uh, allowance. Uh, I have a letter from my doctor saying that I have a back issue. I'm 73 years old. I ride pretty much in Tahoe, but I do come to Ben uh, Time. What I want to point out is there, for instance, uh, Judy Schreiberman's letter that was sent to you is wrought with very unfactual stuff. So if you can get to my uh, submission, it has all the uh, factual information that debunks a lot of the things that she's talking about. I also sent you a copy of something that you've gotten before from me of the rules of the trail and etiquette, which I promote very heavily. I'm actually an advocate now in the Tahoe Basin for e-bike usage. And also there's a letter from another uh, Sierra Club uh, member that is named Travis McGuire that I hope you guys will all look at. Larry, I'm Larry if you can please conclude. Okay. Next we have uh, Tom Boss. Um, so, Tom, um, I am unable to uh, to give you the mic at this moment. You do have uh, an older version of Zoom, and so it's not allowing me um, to allow you to speak. However, um, you can call in. You can call in on one six six nine nine hundred nine one two eight, and you can press star nine, and we can take your comment that way. Or if you like, you can also submit your comments um, online. And again, it will be posted onto our website and it will be sent to the board. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and allow Judy Rogers. Judy. Thank you. I would like to thank directors Kohler and Quintero for underscoring the importance of the watershed's health. Marin Municipal Water District lands are a treasure to pre be preserved. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Next, we have um, a phone number ending in 0420. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute. Caller? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Saul Lakin. Uh, I am uh, calling in both as a rider who rides on the uh, water district lands. Uh, as well as an employee of an electric bicycle company, Specialized Bicycles. 
Um, I'm also, maybe it should be noted, I'm a 29-year-old electric uh, mountain biker. And um, one thing I want to say is, you know, uh, often my, my age group gets singled out for being some of the ne'er-do-wells on the mountain and not participating in processes like these. And I just want to say that we're here, <laughs> we are participating, uh, and we do participate and intend to participate in uh, the educational programs that both the staff and other members of the public are encouraging us uh, to, to do. We're supporters of that. Um, and I basically just want to register my, as a rider, my support for uh, Class 1 access on Marin Water District lands uh, in the same places that bicycles are allowed. And I also want to offer my expertise uh, working for an electric bike company. My job uh, involves engaging in these conversations all around the country. And this process has been a particularly thorough one. I want to applaud everybody who's been involved. Uh, it's been wonderful. Um, and I just want to offer my expertise uh, to the board as they could make this decision. Thank you very much. So at, at this moment, we no longer have any hands up. Um, so just again, another quick reminder, um, if anybody, any, any of the members of the public are on Zoom and participating and would like to uh, make a public comment, you can raise your hand um, or you can press star nine on your phone. Uh, and it looks like we do have some more hands up. So I'm going to go ahead and call on Bill Albright. Bill? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you for the chance to speak. Uh, I'll be very brief. I've, I've read the entire plan. Uh, I am a member of the e-bike community and a member of the CAC committee. And I strongly support the tier one plan. I strongly reject the tier two plan for a lot of reasons. And I strongly support the tier three plan. I think that uh, as more and more people discover the beauty of Mount Tamalpais, they're gonna wanna come there. I think that peer pressure is a far more powerful effect on human behavior than rules or ordinances or enforcement. And I think that uh, if you give e-bikers a chance to participate in the process, uh, that they will uh, help very much in uh, making Mount Tamapias a, a better and safer place for all of us to uh, spend time on. Thanks so much. Next we have Kurt Altvater, Altvater, Kurt. Hello, uh, my name is Kurt Altvater. I want to thank everyone uh, for bringing up this topic. I'm a, I'm a mountain biker. Uh, I have friends who are e-bikers, and I'm also a member of uh, the One Tam Ambassador Board. Um, I use the mountain regularly, and and I'm very much an advocate of sharing the trail, and um, an advocate of stop and say hello. The one point I wanted to make tonight is I I'm very much also an advocate of user fees. I think that user fees are important um, so that we can use those fees to enforce the rules for both bikers, e-bikers, mountain bikers, who are both e-bikers and non-mountain bikers. And at the same time, we could use those funds to perhaps maintain the trails and some of the disruption that people have talked about, erosion and what have you. So that's that's my only point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. Next we have Michael Fernandez Maloney. Hello, Michael. can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Thank you for your time, uh, directors. And I would like to uh, offer my support and and uh, commendation also for Mr. Uh, Horn's, uh, the aspect of Mr. Horn's report and option three, uh, which uh, proposes, as I understand it, a Tamarancho-like registration and permit system for e-mountain bikes on Mount Tamalpais. I think this is a great idea. I think a Tamarancho-like uh, registration and permit system would, uh, all of the pros that um, uh, Mr. Horn lists are really great. Um, and I just think it promotes use by individuals who, um, um, this includes a lot of the people I ride with on a weekly basis on Mount Tamalpais due to age without e-assistance are not gonna to get to enjoy that mountain uh, as they get older. It's that simple for me. Thank you. Um, and Tom Boss has his hand up. Let's go ahead and um, attempt this one more time. 
so Tom, I, again, I'm unable to allow you to speak because you have an older version of Zoom. So um, I just want to let you know, I, I did attempt to give you the mic. Um, unfortunately, it is not allowing me to do so. Um, if you want to call in, um, again, our the number is 669-900-9128. And uh, you can press star nine. Um, we do have two more hands that were raised. Uh, Thomas Jung. Thomas Jung. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation tonight. I just wanted to share that I'm an avid hiker and I've had good experience with e-bikers um, being courteous and, and sharing the road. So um, just wanted to share that perspective. And I always feel like change is difficult. And I remember when the snowboarders came onto the mountain and it was strongly discouraged from allowing snowboards onto a ski mountain. And of course we have to change and we have to let different demographics have enjoyment of the mountain just like hikers do. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Have Jim Baldwin. Jim. Oh, thank you very much. This is Jim Baldwin speaking. I'm a 57-year-old uh, conventional mountain biker, and I've been very fortunate to have been invited into a couple of groups of e-bikers as well as conventional bikers. Uh, and the going sort of anecdotal evidence for, is that you can't really ride an e-bike in this group unless you're at least 70 years old, which allows me the privilege of riding with a number of older guys who have been on the mountain in some cases since the 1970s. And when it comes to recognizing uh, the biodiversity of the mountain, you can find these guys stopping and talking about the natural features of the mountain, the butterflies, the animals, all the different things that we see every time we ride together. And it's wonderful. And I'm just here to say, I think that mountain biking access increases awareness of biodiversity on the mountain. Thank you. going to attempt to allow Tom Boss um, to talk. Tom? Hey. I'm sorry. One moment. Hi, Tom. I, we heard you for a second. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? You can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I had to switch computers really quickly. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank everybody. I think the three-tier process is a really good path forward. We look forward to participating, Marin County Bicycle Coalition, that is, as a stakeholder, and also uh, working with some of the other stakeholders. Um, there's these planned meetings with individuals, but let's try and bring some of these groups together at some point as well. Um, I just wanted to say I'm 100% for biodiversity um, on the watershed. I live in Forest Knolls and you probably don't realize it, but that's, I'm like a thousand feet away from the watershed. And, um, and there is, if you look at the watershed map, you'll see that two thirds of it are very low impact from, from the Rock Springs parking lot near the mountain theater, all the way out to the Kent uh, Dam uh, is a huge swath of land with very little impact. Um, and I just, I just, um, yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of, of places where we can um, enhance uh, the, the watershed, but also balance it with recreation uh, on Mount Tam proper where uh, so many people uh, do enjoy oh, different so types of activities. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, at this point, um, we no longer have any hands up. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sharice. You did an outstanding job. Um, so sorry, President Gibson. Yeah. Um, we have another hand up from Larry Kushner. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow yeah. Larry. Speak. We had you for a second and um, you cut out again. So um, it keeps coming back. Uh, it keeps on muting me. We, we uh, can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, great. I just wonder if anybody in the group wants to ask me any questions. I'm very heavily involved with the Forest Service in Tahoe. 
I've been following what's been going on on Mount Tam for quite a while, and I have a lot of input that I could give you if you have any questions. Anybody have any questions? Okay, I just want to bring one up one thing. It was mentioned about OpMed, other powered mobility devices, and it would behoove you to read that. It's part of the ADA rules, and it actually says anybody that is has any type of disability can ride an e-bike. It doesn't say specifically e-bike, but the definition does fit e-bikes. So just another thought that you guys can uh, look at. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that concludes our public comments. Okay. Um, now uh, we have, I think we're going to do uh, open time. Okay. Um, are there any Anybody have any comments for open time? Anything not on the agenda? So President Gibson, we did have one comment that was emailed in advance that was not on the agenda that was sent to the board members and it will be posted online on our website. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess with that, uh, we can conclude the, uh, the meeting and uh, thank you all uh, very much for your participation. Thanks. President, for all President all Gibson. Yes. Right, we were going to do it in the memory. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought that Cynthia had already done that. It's, it's, we're, we're, I'm sorry. All right, we're we're going to. We decided we're going to conclude the uh, meeting tonight in memory of Yui Johnson. You know, um, and and thank you very much for the comment that Cynthia had made for the record. I think uh, earlier on tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay, good. We adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.